guest today is someone whom I've always admired. He's a spinner who's a perfect mold of skill, guile, and above all, a very big heart. Welcome to the show, Daniel Luca Vittori. Welcome to Spin Talks, mate. Thanks, Arthur. Appreciate that. See, seriously, till the time I didn't work with you recently, I've always thought that you were a proper, proper Kiwi. And I like these names. I've always been fond of surnames and trying to figure out where they are from. I had no idea that Vittori's, I always used to think Vittori's are from Italy, but I had no idea that you're an Italian. That was, oh, they got people can join us. So my father, uh, my father was born and bred in Italy. He uh, he came across when he was when he was young. So, but you know, full ki full Kiwis now. He's been over here fifty years. But uh, yeah, some strong Italian roots. Can you speak Italian? Uh, no, I, I can't. I mean, I, when we were young, you used to be able to understand the dialect. It's more a German, Ital more more of a German dialect because they're from right up north. So, okay. My father, when he when when he's been back to Italy, he sort of comes back to him, but but not for us. Okay, interesting. Uh, mate, thanks for joining me on uh, Spin Talks. And as I told you, this is just a, an informal. It's like a chat which we generally have in our in our green rooms or whether when we're at the ground, but more on a on a on a basis where lots of young people can be educated from it, and that's that's the idea behind it. So for me, the first thing is. You've been one of the most successful left-arm spinners in the history of the game. There have been some wonderful left-arm spinners. This game, this game has seen Vishen Bedi, Headley Verity, Headley Verity I've never seen. Uh, but in terms of uh, what you've done to left-arm spin and world cricket, um, what are your roots? How did it start? Because I know for a fact that you were, you were also a medium pacer like me and I think you switched over at the same age as me to spin. Uh, for me, that left arm spin never spun when I turned to spin. How was it for you? Well, I think I, mean, I, I never grew up wanting to be a spinner. I think, like all most New Zealanders, you see Sir Richard Hadley uh, and you see a lot of other seam bowlers. Our, our country's records are dominated by um, fast bowlers, medium pace bowlers, swing bowlers. You know, when I was young, so those are the, the people that I looked up to. And I suppose the first the first spinner that I really saw that I admired was John Bracewell. Um, okay. And he was quite an aggressive off spinner, which you probably didn't see that often. He was, you used to, I think, I think you take it back to first class cricket in New Zealand. Um, the the ways that spinners were used were the back end of the first session or, or the middle session. And so I, I, ne I never really saw a lot, I ne never had a lot of spinners to admire or look up to. I think I was okay. fortunate that when I was you know, 15, 16, medium pace bowling wasn't going very far. Um, I was bowling about as fast as I did bowling spins. So, and for some reason, I had a natural uh, affinity with it, and it and it came relatively easy when I was when I when I tried it. And I suppose because I suppose the flip side of the fact that so many um, New Zealanders are fast bowlers is that there's no, no one actually grows up playing spin, and so if you have you have a little bit of ability, you can be quite successful, and, and that, that's the anomaly around uh, spin bowling New Zealanders. A lot of First class cricket, most of the, the record wicket takers are, are spin bowlers and notably left arm spin bowlers. So that hadn't quite translated into New Zealand cricket, but I was, I was very fortunate that from that, that quick journey of taking up spin bowling, it wasn't too far before I was, was playing first class cricket and, and then on to New Zealand after that. Yeah, it's fascinating. And we've, we've been very lucky in India that we've had such a huge tradition and a rich lineage of, of spinners to look up to. And for me, you know, I was very lucky that I was with. I was coached by Bishan Bedi and Manandar Singh, two of the finest left arm spinners. So I've, I've played the game as well. But it's interesting you say that you were a fast bowler and you ha only had somebody like a John Bracewell to look up to. The other, the other prominent Kiwi spinner which comes to my mind is Deepak Patel, who probably is from our part of the world. So who taught you spin? How did you move to spin? Because if you, if you started bowling spin at 15, by 17, you had already played for... New Zealand, so that's a that's a quick transition. Uh, there's two parts to it. I think I think I was I was very fortunate that there were no other spinners, and that that, that I I got a lot of opportunity um, because I I was reasonably successful straight away. Um, I was yeah. able to to rise the ranks pretty quickly, and I went from first eleven at school spin bowler um, to trying it out with rep teams, having success there, and then really getting opportunities the the whole way along. And I think. I think whilst New Zealand's never 
produced um, that many spin bowlers. I think there's always a, a an admiration or maybe even a little bit of a jealousy when they see teams from overseas, um, Australia, India, Pakistan, all the amazing spin bowlers that have come through um, those countries. That I think New Zealand was always always wanted a, a spin bowler, even though it was it was very difficult to produce. So so that's why I think I was given opportunities very quickly. Um, Steve Rickson came over from Australia and in a typical Aussie manner, he wanted to be bold and aggressive and make some changes. And, and Dipak was, uh, I think, well, Dipak, Dipak played in my debut. He was 38 and I was 18. So we just had the 20 years age gap and then he finished soon after. Um, but, but like I said, there was, a, there was a, there's a real desire to find that spin bowler. And so I think I, I benefit, benefited from that. I was, it was, I mean, like any young spinner, it's, it's hard to, to know your game at 18, 19, 20. It really comes in the, in the back end of your career um, where you get to understand yourself, understand batsmen, understand how they work. So I, I, was, I was lucky, really, in a lot of ways that I, that I got all those opportunities when I was so young. Yeah, I understand the opportunities. But the thing is, there must have been somebody who must have helped you with your basic technique. Because I still remember when I moved from team to spin, I was just lucky that there were two guys who taught me how to grip the ball, uh, what are the uh, basics of spin? Uh, but you need somebody, isn't it? You can't just move from fast bowling to spin. But who was who was that help for you? Well, or no it's one? Funny or were you self taught? It was self taught early on. I mean, I used to bowl with a three finger grip because um, my hands are too small. So that was that. It just came really natural to me. Um, and I think I, I look back on it. I think I, I took up a lot of the. I suppose the characteristics of bowling medium pace as well in terms of my my technique and my run up. Um, so I suppose that probably probably helped helped a little bit. But then then I got to meet John Bracewell, who was my under nineteen uh, coach. We toured toured England together, and he he never really talked about the the technical side of things. He was he was re- really about the mental side of game, how you could attack players, how you could stay in the game, and he gave me a. I think he gave me a blueprint of how to be effective in in a game because I think, and you know this as well, is that you can bowl beautifully and, and not be effective. And he yep, he absolutely. really he really gave me an understanding of this is this is what you need to do in certain situations. This is how you stay in the game, and this is how you survive in a lot of ways. Because I think, I mean, I think you know spinners and wicket keepers there, and there's only one of them. So if they don't do well, people move on pretty pretty quickly from them and so he, he he gave me the tools and I think that's the thing that I always um I think thought about myself was that I, I knew how to su- survive in a game as a bowler it wasn't always pretty but I, f- I felt like I could I could do a job in most situations and I and, and once again I was lucky because there was no, there was no one knocking down the door it's a bit different for, for you guys with the the pedigree of the spin bowlers and how many how many how many good ones there's been I mean even over the course of your career you could you can name a handful of some of the you know the greatest spinners that have, have played in, in India. Um, so I, I think being from New Zealand really helped, but also learning learning on the job was was a big part of my development. You're being too humble, Dan. Uh, you're sounding like uh, John Wright when he joined us. He always used to tell us that look, I got 25 innings because there was no one else to play. Yeah. But that's not <laughs> but that's not the case with you, Dan. Uh, since you mentioned the grip. A couple of things which are interesting because, again, for me, um, it's fascinating. Uh, we're all spinners, but all of us grip slightly differently and think slightly differently in spite of being left-arm spinners or off-spinners. Like, I still remember every time I used to play with Harbhajan, and I was just amazed how he could hold the ball like that. For me, it yeah. was always a conventional, this wide grip with, with these three fingers and my, and my thumb as a support. Uh, which, which actually was like a rudder. Uh, it didn't do much apart from giving some control and uh, while this index finger did everything and this, this middle finger and that rest acted as a fulcrum. Uh, how, was it, how was it for you? Would you say that yours was a similar grip? Because I think you've got very similar hands in terms of size, although you're much taller than me. No, so I was, was going to say, I think even though I am tall, I've got, I have got small hands. So when I met... Uh, Monty Panesar for the first time. I was. I've never. I've never been so jealous in my life. His, his hands, are, <laughs> hands, hands are enormous. They sort of envelop my hand when he when he shook his hand. So because my hands are yeah. small, I actually, 
I just started like that with with three fingers um, because I okay. couldn't I couldn't split the ball into there. And I spent I actually spent a lot of time just like trying to separate that out so right. I could stretch as much as possible. So eventually, when my hands grew a little bit more, I was with a conventional grip as well. I people used to talk to me about my thumb and how I held my thumb on the ball, but my my thumb I never really thought about it. It was just more of a placeholder, and I was always focused on that. The feeling between the the middle and 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 forefinger. I think that that was when I felt good. When I felt a really good ball, it was it was the the feeling in between those two fingers that gave me the confidence that I could you know, spend some time on the ball. It's when the ball gets soft and that that uh, I mean the kookaburra after sixty overs. It's like oh, how am I going to hold on to this? And that 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 was always difficult. But that feeling in between 60, those two. Sixty or sixteen? Sixty or sixteen? Yeah, <laughs> used used to be six. Used to be sixty. Maybe sixteen now. No, it's interesting you again say that because again, uh, I, I, I had no clue about spin bowling. And for me, I was always told that a little part of this has to always be touching the ball. That gives you adequate control, which means that you're neither holding it too tight nor too loosely. And a little part of that, uh, that or that crescent around that or uh, beneath the index finger needs to be always in touch with the ball that gives you a lot of control and the maneuverability to do whatever you want uh, i think uh, and the more i think about it i think grip is personal i think it's okay. it's how you can, how you can feel comfortable and i think there's there's a lot of other parts of the technique and the run up and the um the technical aspects that you that you can be more formulaic and you can copy people but the ball's got to feel good in your hand if the, if if it doesn't feel good in your hand then you, you is it this your brain starts to work poorly and then things go wrong so ball feeling good in your hands is the starting point exactly uh, that's why i said when i when i used to see harbhajan for the first time i could never imagine i tried bowling like that with that three yeah. split finger and the ball never came out of my hand so uh, 100% you can teach you can say that these are the basics but finally it's it's the bowler who has to feel comfortable isn't it yeah yeah and i think and and that's that's so personal and i think the other thing about it is it's it can change as well. I think as you grow and develop as a, as a spin bowler, you you'll learn more about yourself and and what feels comfortable. And I think, com yeah, like I said, com I think comfort is the starting point for for all all spin bowlers. Because if if you're at the top of your mark and it just doesn't feel right, then you've, you've got nowhere to go really. Dan, you're you're a coach and you coach lots of young spinners um, and and international spinners as well. Growing up, uh, for me again. Uh, coming from me, uh, Bishan Bedi and Manindra Singh always used to give us a red and a white ball, uh, yeah. which meant that once I released the ball, I, I should only see one side of it. Um, did anybody do that to you, or did you do that yourself? Because you hardly see that nowadays. Or do you do that with the, the people yeah, you coach? No, I think it's the it's the best personal coaching tool I've ever had. Is just being able to s oh. see see what I well, practice what I want to do in terms of my head. I want to bowl top spinner. I want to bowl crossing, obviously. And, and you see it actually come out. And then you relate that that visual um, part of it to the feel. And I think that's the, the, the best thing. I, I saw Otis Gibson did the best thing. He just puts a bit of uh, white tape over the seam, the red ball okay. and red over that. So if you haven't got a red and white, I think that's just as, as easy a way you can do it. And I think when, it, when I talk to spinners or young spinners, it, it is all about the visual... I want you to bowl a top spinner. I want you to know what it feels like to bowl a top spinner. See, it feels what it looks like. Because as soon as soon as you get your technique good enough to bowl a top spinner, then every other ball generally is easy because it's just maneuvering your your wrist a little bit more. It's when when bowl, young bowlers can't bowl that top spinner, I find they're going to get themselves in trouble because most of it's all going to be undercut and sort of that front on seam stuff, which is fine. You can bowl those all the t once in a while, mix it up, but. If a spinner can always come back to being able to bowl a top spinner, because that means his action is strong, he's following through his run-up stride, his, his front front stride's not too long, um, I always think that's the starting point. And if things are going wrong, I always try and work back from there to say, well, how do we how do we get back to a top spinner? Because then everything's easier from there. Hey, you, you mentioned the action, and, and it's interesting. I remember seeing you or watching you. I, I think I'm three or four, three years older than you. So watching you in under-19 cricket, um, huge hair and long hair and thin glasses. <laughs> and then you made your debut. It was always coming in between, uh, between the umpire and the stump, quite diagonal as we all did. Uh, some more diagonal and some a little bit straighter. 
why did you suddenly move to completely straight on or a bill, I, literally a, a straight bowling action? The, the thing for me was I, I found that I was starting to lose uh, control of the length of my delivery stride when I was chopping okay. back and forward from round to over. And I always thought okay. that for, when I was bowling well, as my delivery stride was pretty short, allowed me to stand tall, um, hand, yeah. Uh, um, the thing is, stay longer on the ball. You can get over it and bowl that top spinner like I talked about. And I found that um, coming against qu more quality batsmen and then being aggressive, um, I needed to defend against them a little bit as well as attacking. And when I was defending, I found my delivery stride getting a little bit longer. And that, that was always the case as well. And bowling playing lots of one days or lots of T20s is that my delivery stride would get longer. And that would mean I was undercutting the ball rather than getting over the top of it. So I just found that, that that straight on style allowed me to control that delivery stride a bit better. I don't know. You've always been through and around. What, what was your, that was a preference for you? Uh, so initially I was quite diagonal. And as I said, I was, an, I was a blank slate uh, where, when Bishan Bedi and Maninder Singh worked on me. And they always uh, forced me to be slightly straighter. And that's why I always used to have the umpire stand as far back as possible. So every time, for me, every time I went, uh, like what you did, that was like a corrective tool. So initially I was going quite wide of the crease and Vishen Bedi didn't like it. He wanted me to be much closer because I was learning. Whereas Mananda Singh was always telling me that although you're going across, as long as your body is not opening towards fine leg, you're fine. And once you open towards fine leg, the ball rather than going this will start doing this. But since you're going over the ball and your ball's going as it should, don't worry too much about it. The more you bowl, you will adjust yourself automatically, which started happening as I started learning and bowling more and more and more. Uh, but for me, every time I went, uh, like you did, or slightly outside, that was just a corrective drill for me, just to get into a good solid position if I, feel that, if I felt that I was opening out too much. And that, that, was, that was it. But for me, it was always the umpire too far back, and they always used to hate it. They always used to say that we can't watch if you're... Uh, bowling a no ball or not, which I used to do a lot. So uh, they always thought that I was trying to push them back uh, because I didn't want them to see the no ball, but that was not that. It was because I was diagonal, but not that diagonal. It was just at an angle. Yeah, and I, I always used to admire that, the, your ability to get in so close because I I thought that that was my concern sometimes is that when I we, went just straight, the umpire would often push me out a little bit in terms of I... I would think I was getting close to them, but I, I would be pushing off the side. And therefore, my by the time I released the ball, I was quite wide of the crease. And I always thought that the guys like yourself who stayed either mid-crease or even inside mid-crease meant that you actually don't have to spin the ball as much because your drift your drift is more, well, feels more, um, more pronounced. Uh, what's it pronounced because of because the, the it's just coming from that angle. And therefore, when the batsman sees it, he his his eye line changes and it spins a little bit. Whereas when it's coming wide, the batsman can actually track it a lot, lot easier. And even if it drifts, it's already coming from that angle. So I think for young spinners, being as, as close to the mid, middle of the crease, even inside it, um, is so important because it means you can be a lot more effective. You don't, you don't actually don't have to spin the ball as much or drift as much, but you will because you're, you're more, more often than not in good positions. Uh, how did you correct your, your delivery stride, Dan? Because you're a tall man. And I, I'm, I'm, what, I'm, I'm a six-footer, you're six-five or something like that. And I had a, a generally big delivery side. By God's grace, it was just that I was still able to transfer my body weight. But Vishen Bedi and Manandu Singh always used to say that you correct your leap. That's what they always told me. With your leap, that, that loading position leap is where you correct your delivery side. Was it something like that for you as well? Uh, I, I made a, for, for me, it was two things. It was my run-up. Uh, if, my, if my first stride... Um, was too long, then every stride was too long. So I made a, a, re a really conscious effort for my first stride to be small, uh, short so that I could gradually build up to that momentum. I mean, you look at Shane Warne and how slow he was in his first couple of strides and then he explode, exploded through into his crease. I, was, I wasn't like that, but I'm, I knew if my strides were getting too long, then my delivery stride was going to be too long. So I tried to correct it in the first stride. So it would be slow, small, build, build, build. And then I made a a conscious effort to actually tell myself to to slam my get my front foot down as quickly as possible um so that so then that would 
force it to be as short as possible because the shorter it is, the the easier it is to get over and you just spend more time on the ball. Your release point goes from sort of way back there, doesn't it, to there. And that just means your 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 fingers are spending so much time on the ball. You can you can spin the ball more and get more drift. Everything. You led me on to quite a few beautiful questions now. Uh, look, as left arm spinners, what are the variations we have? We say the normal stock delivery is something which you always have. Then uh, everybody talks about the the arm ball, uh, which comes in with the arm, uh, and then the top spinner. And unless and until you're you're very flexible. <laughs> It's tough to bowl the dusra. You can bowl the undercutter. How did you bowl all these different deliveries? I know you can't you can't demonstrate it uh, because we're not doing that. But still, with your hand and with your grip, if you can. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think I think what te- technique allows you to bowl those balls. So I think to your point around the short delivery stride being mid crease, those those are still the most important things because if you have that short delivery stride, like we just talked about, it allows your wrist and fingers to do all the work because. If the for me, if my delivery stroke was long, then my my hand was back there, and all I could do was really undercut the ball because it's impossible to get a top spinner from there. Um, yeah, so I always focus on releasing the ball as far forward as possible. I mean, I think you see Graham Swan when you see him from side on. It feels like he's almost when he releases the ball, it's past his head, and and that's why he got so much drift and spin. But for me, that allowed me to bowl those variations around the top spinner. Um, the arm ball, the, 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 the one that I, I really liked in the back end of my career was the cross seamer. I, I really enjoyed buying that because you just didn't know what it was going to do. And that was, that was an important ball. I, I spent a good summer bowling the, uh, sorry, winter trying to work on the douche. And I actually did get it out reasonably well, but it affected everything else. And I couldn't bowl, I couldn't bowl anything else basically. So I could just bowl a douche and everything else was a waste of time. So I sort of gave up on it after that because I, I felt like it affected my, technique too much to allow me to actually um, do, do the things that I already did well. Uh, Dusra is something which is, is interesting because I remember Saklan Mushtaq used to spin the ball a lot when he came on. And once he started bowling more of the Dusra, the, the ball started spinning lesser and lesser. And I think it's, uh, I don't know if you've noticed Mutaya Murlidharan as well. He was such a huge spinner of the ball. But once he started bowling or started bowling the Dusra more often, that spin went down. Is that something which you felt as well when you tried pulling the dusra? For me, every time I tried it, it went out so slowly that I felt that I needed 16 yards to be effective, not 22 yards. Well, two, two things. I never saw Murali's spin any less. It felt like they spent a mile every time I, uh, <laughs> I faced them. I, 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 reckon I, I think I got two good douches out in my whole entire life and they, they felt amazing and they bounced and they they spun back in, but my, like you saying there, I felt like I felt like I had no, I couldn't get any momentum on the ball, and unless you sort of break your elbow and try to spin it down there. But if you try to stay as straight as possible and get that right over that top spin, so my, mine was probably more a top spinner rather than than a doucher, and it just it bounced and kicked uh, more completely, than anything. I com- completely feel the same. It was just more like it used to go limp its way across rather than have any kind of fizz. Which the other deliveries had. Yeah, and, and because of the angle, you naturally it's a, it feels a little bit more pronounced. But um, I mean, I, I wish I could have done it. I, I mean, looking back on those guys through the sort of late nineties, Saklain and then Murali and Habajan when he got it, and, and Ajmal, um, you know, there was, was I know I know there's there's question marks around um, uh, elbow degree and all that sort of stuff, but it was still a skill. It was an amazing skill to, to see a ball spin both ways at 90 k's, and, and to face it wasn't wasn't much fun either. Yeah, I tried breaking my elbow. Uh, one ball went to one pole, and the other ball went to the other pole. <laughs> couldn't couldn't get it straight. Well, uh, that is, is a left arm spinner been out. I can't even think of a left arm spinner who's pulled it off really. No, I've never seen one. No, I've never no. seen one. That's what I'm saying. That's why that's why I always wonder. We have the normal spinner which spins. And obviously the top spinner, which you spoke about, and you mentioned the cross seamer. But that was the cross seamer more for red ball cricket, or was it for one day cricket? It was for both. I mean, the more the the more opportunities you got with a newer ball, it certainly helped bowl a cross seamer. And I tried to bowl like a, a straight across cross seamer, and then I try and bowl one that was sort of um, just slightly on an angle, and that would it just it just gave slight variations as well. And I always felt that just that 
when it when it hurried off the pitch, it gave you such an effective weapon to whether it's LB or just to put a batsman in a slightly defensive mode. Because as soon as in the one day games or T Twenty games, he thought about clearing a front leg in those first power play overs. If you had that ball that skidded on quickly, um, it, it could re- it could really um, stop them from being able to pull that off. Yeah, yeah. And what was your grip for the undercutter and the arm ball like? My uh, undercutter, my my grip. The only time my grip changed was for the arm ball. So I kept it. It was all about wrist position for me for the top spinner. You know, stock ball, undercutter, and then I, you know, that sort of slider one that left arm spinners bowl where you sort of just open up your wrist. But the the arm ball for me was normal grip, and then in my load up, I'd just shift to to there. Some batsmen saw it, and some batsmen didn't. So it was just, it was as simple as that. You, you could work out who didn't see it, who didn't see it. Yeah, I learned my arm ball the the three fingered way. Uh, Bishan Bedi always used to speak about it, and he used to swing a lot. And then as I played, because my load was such that it just changed naturally to to something like that. But also there are times when the seam goes perfectly. For the batsman, you feel as if the ball's spinning, but somehow it it hits. Whether I don't know whether the wrist gets locked, we get tired or what. The ball tends to come in with the arm. Have you ever felt that? Yeah, I mean it's just yeah. oh, it's one of those things. I think it just this just happens, doesn't it? So you 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 learn what feels comfortable and what feels good, and then sometimes you release one, it feels perfect, and it sort of feels like it's swinging, bowling an out swinger rather than an in swinger. So yeah, there's, there's there's good days with an arm ball and bad days with an arm ball. <laughs> Dan, you, you spoke about the, the, the fact that you, you wanted your, your delivery point to be slightly ahead of your head. Um, say, uh, if our head is at uh, 12 o'clock, possibly uh, 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock is where you want your release point to be. Um, was that your release point all the time for all the variations? Or did you, did you still, uh, or, and also I have to uh, remind everyone that you are possibly the best uh, you're very good in terms of being able to change pace. I think with that same arm action, I don't think I've seen anyone better than that. You could, with that height as well, one would come so quickly, one would come down so slowly. What were your release points for those kind of variations? Uh, I think you, you touched on the main point around um, the arm speed ha- cannot change. Your arm speed can never change because that, that's what gives you deception um, and that's what allows you to um, yeah, make make those subtle changes without them being obvious. And so for me, the re- the release points were all about the wrist. So I could slow the ball down when I was trying to bowl top spinners in terms of my release, my arm speed would be the same, but just for the natural, the way it released, it came out slower and it just got faster as I went more and more undercut. So for me, I, it wasn't a conscious thing to say, okay, my hand's there, there, there. I always focused on that one o'clock uh, release that you talked about but when I see myself from side on when I'm bowling the faster one I'm definitely more 12 o'clock even further back and the slower okay. it is the more the the, the, the later the release is I always oh, found okay. the slower I wanted to be the late, later it was and if I, that's where I, re, I need to be really strong with my legs because if you collapse that back leg and your and your delivery stride got too long then it never allowed you to to get slower and slower well you could get slower but you'd have nothing on the ball and so to be slow and have something on the ball is, is every spinner's dream, I think. Yeah, that is something which uh, people hardly speak about, isn't it? Uh, the importance of the leg. Uh, everybody thinks spinners have to be strong from here. The shoulders need to be supple. But ultimately, for guys who are bowling 30, 40 overs, it's, it's about that, that leg and that, that strength there, which allows you to continue to be effective. Yeah, particularly for, you know, both 30, 40 overs. Um, if you don't have that, that ability to, to keep that consistency and in, in in strength in your legs, then it just gets easier and easier as a batsman to face you. Whereas that, that spring off your back, well, for us, our, our, our back left, left leg um, just helps everything. As soon as that starts collapsing, then you lose everything up here. So like I talked about at the start of the run-up, the run-up was important for me. So it's almost like your feet and legs start everything and, and allow your, your arms and fingers to do, and wrists to do, do, the, do the easy work. Your legs have to do the hard work. What, what did the lead arm mean for you, Dan? Because we were given a lot of importance. We were always told that it's the lead arm which controls everything. Uh, you were not somebody who threw the arm up, you, or you, you, your arm was more here. Um, what, what did it mean? 
what did it tell you? What was it? Uh, what was its main purpose? You feel the lead arm? It, w it wasn't, uh, and you're right. It w because my my lead arm didn't extend out. In a lot of ways, I sort of looked looked through it. I think I blocked myself off a lot. Um, it wasn't an important thing to me. Actually, it was it was all the other things that I was spoken about that 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 allowed my front arm to to get in a good position. I, I knew if my front arm was open, then I was in some trouble. But there were other things going on if my, my if my front arm did get into that position. So my, my focus was around the run up, um, the strength in your legs, and, and standing tall. Because as soon as you stand tall, that forces your arm into that position. I found as soon as I collapsed, then I would just open up a little bit. So I found my arm was a byproduct of either doing things well or doing things poorly. And I went back to those things before I actually looked at my arm. I don't know if it's the same for you. Are you were you did you focus on your arm or were you were other no, Aspects. for me, yeah, massively. Because uh, since you, it's interesting, that's why I, I that's why I love docking spin. Um, you you spoke about the change of pace. For me, it was always about controlling my leading arm, and uh, this had to go down slowly, and this had to be the same pace. That's what I felt always. And <clears throat> my release points varied from eleven o'clock to one one thirty. That's that's what I always had every time I could. I wanted to do a few things. I've, there have been times where I've released behind me, very close to my head, and then in front. So that was a big arc which I had. So it's fascinating here hearing you because I've, I've bowled alongside you. I've seen you bowl for such a long time. You were always strong there. Uh, possibly is it because of your height as well that you were much taller? Is that something which also forced you to be much there rather than doing something different? Uh, probably. I think. I think you know everyone sort of tried to emphasise. You know that I should use my height so that if if I was collapsing that back leg, then then I was then I was wasting that that advantage that I that I did have. So it was, and that, and so the, I mean, I think the thing you find with bowling spin is that you change and mature and develop, and you find out different things about yourself all the time. So how you how I did that changed over the years. So maybe early on it was standing still and just bowling into a glove, and then later on it was taking a few steps. Um, and then as further develop your video yourself to make sure that 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 back leg staying as strong as possible and then Overall, it's just a, a conscious decision during training I never tried to think about it too much during the game, but during training I'd work on it and Then hope all that work would allow you to be as as natural as you could be in a game and actually Focus on the batsman rather than technique because I I can't remember ever having a good day when I was focusing on technique <laughs> Now, the, the reason why I also think about it more is that I imagine we've got 22 yards and as a tall bowler, the taller you get, the release point is even higher, which means mm. that once you release, you possibly need to get a parabola, you need possibly 30 yards. Whereas imagine a Ramesh Pawar who's much shorter, he, was, he had to literally throw it up. The parabola looks different, isn't it? The flight yeah. looks very different. And for me, who's in between, he's possibly five or six inches shorter than me. Me being at six feet, I possibly had that cushion to get that uh, that arc a bit more than possibly you. We had Nilesh Kulkarni who was much taller. Uh, so imagine the ball coming from there. If he had to flight the ball, he needed a longer pitch uh, is what I feel. So if you look at it from that point of view, possibly the release points also change for different bowlers. Ramesh Pawar could even deliver even from behind. He, he had yeah. such a kind of control over what he wanted to do. So it's, 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 it's interesting. Uh, thinking of release points of different bowlers. Harbhajan, always there and slightly in front. I can imagine, as you said, Swanee. Swanee's front arm also went down very quickly and his front yeah. knee buckled as well, which I was always told that your front leg needs to be ramrod straight. So it's always fascinating seeing guys. There are different ways to bell a cat and all these guys have been super, super bowlers. All of you have been super bowlers. So it's interesting understanding technique and what works for whom. Yeah, and I think I think the the best current example is Nathan Lyon, where I think his re his release is as, as good as I've ever seen, and how exactly. consistent he is with it all. And you, and you see him side on, and how strong his back leg is, and then he's he sort of all everything's coiled up tight, and then when he releases this, he just gets perfect. So I think there are there are different examples of it, but ultimately it's it is about how you get to that that release point. And I think Lyon Lyon's is, is as good as I've seen. Yeah, and also it's, it's interesting you bring Nathan Lyon. And we spoke about so many variations. Ashwin talks about so many variations. Budgie had variations. 
But Nathan Lyon has got so many wickets, just bowling stock delivery. Just yes. bowling stock delivery. He doesn't bowl anything else. He doesn't try the undercutter. He doesn't bowl a swinging arm ball or whatever. But it's just unbelievable. He doesn't have a dusra, but just the stock delivery has got him so many wickets in every format. And, and I think the fact that against Indian batsmen as well, an off spinner against Indian batsmen, I, I mean, uh, you struggle to think of how many have actually challenged and troubled them over the years. And he, he's been incredible at that, particularly in Australia, where that, that stock ball gets that bounce, he gets that lovely drift, and he's just, he's just consistent. I, ca I can't think of a, a Nathan Lyon bad ball where he's getting cut for four. Um, he's, just, he's just in that spot, and because he's got so many revolutions on it, it, it creates so much uh, uncertainty for very, very good batsmen. I mean, he's, he's, he's troubled Coley, he's troubled Pajara. They're all amazing players of spin. Uh, look, you spoke about drift, and every spinner loves once that drift, Dan, how did drift happen for you? Again, um, people always talk about a left arm spinner should be bowling from an end where the, the breeze is coming from third man or point to allow that, that drift to come into a right hander or like an in swing to a, a left. But many people also talk about the finish, how you finish gets you the drift. Some people talk about the number of rotations on the ball. What was it for you? Or was uh, it a combination was, of all three? I think for me, and my, my focal point was around those river revolutions, I think. And that was being in a good position, being able to release the ball late, having almost in you know, that stock ball. They talk about Nathan Lyon's stock ball. That that seam position allows that drift to come into place. And I, I could never drift a ball that I was undercutting. And so I had to, the only way I could drift them was you know, those that ability to put as much revolutions as possible in there. And as we talked about, there's so many things that allow you to get into that good position. But if I got into that good position, I knew I could drift the ball. And as we know, drift is, is just as valuable as spin, if not more valuable. And so if, if, I, if I could get into that position, I knew I had a weapon. Um, but for me, it was about that. And if, if, I, if I couldn't get into that position, I never drifted the ball. And therefore, it was just a, a straight ball. And if it didn't turn, it was, it was a really straight ball. So, uh, the, so the, the breeze was immaterial. No, you. well, I mean, you'd love it, but it wasn't. You, you know what it's like bowling in Wellington. You didn't, you didn't often get a choice. Um, um, you're going down from your bowling into the wind, whether it's if it's helpful to you or not. So I bowled a lot of overs like that, and I, and I made it. I think I made it within myself not to worry about the breeze. I mean, it's, okay. the, the the captain will always ask, but more often than not, it was the revolutions that you got on the ball that brought in that drift. I mean. Shane Warne's the best I've ever seen at it, even though he's a, he's a leg spinner. That that drift was was a sight to behold, and I think he 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 was able to do that purely through through his revolutions. And hearing him speak, it was about him being in strong positions to allow that to happen, and that's the, that's the basis for any spin ball. Yeah, for me, growing up watching Maninder Singh was just fascinating because we, we always speak about Shane Warne's drift. Uh, I've never seen the ball. Actually, uh, it, it would make a seam bowler and a swing bowler very proud watching Maninder Singh, the way he yeah. got the ball to swing in so much. Uh, and I asked him, I asked him, how did he get it? And it, it, he always speaks about a slightly, uh, not 100% uh, close to your ear, but slightly wider uh, release point and also the way you finish. It's, it's like an arc which you finish and where you finish, along obviously with the revolutions of the ball as well, but the way you finish. because. There have been times where if you finish between your legs, Dan, you can get the ball to drift out as well. Like Harbhajan Singh is a classic example. Open chest. Yeah. Like Nathan Lyon and Swan used to get the ball to drift out to a right-hander. You always notice that for Harbhajan, if you faced him, it was always drifting out to you as well, which means drifting into a, a right-hander because of him being open-chested and the way he finished. I think, I think to, to what you're relaying around Meninda, I think in some ways the same for me. I, I always, when I talk about spending as much time on the ball as possible as you can and so you say that that big follow through and you're strong through there I think that was similar to me probably just voiced it differently is that I wanted to the ball I almost felt like I wanted to bowl the ball straight into the ground because that meant that I was holding on to the ball as long as possible and therefore you're actually putting more revolutions on it and I think it's that's just voiced in a different way around that follow through is so incredibly important to to being able to drift the ball, put the revolutions on it. And it, it, to be able to follow through, you had to do all those things that we've been talking about the whole time. But it's just another little 
um, piece at the end of it to for 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 a young bowler to really focus on. Yeah, you mentioned how important that run up and getting to the hitting the crease is. Um, as soon as you release the ball, could you make out the quality of the release? Every ball you could say, ah, oh, this hasn't come out well. Yeah, oh, this has come out time. brilliantly. Every time. This, the, the, that's come out really well, and how's it gone for six was a uh, was the thing that I thought of. <laughs> no, I, I definitely could ease, hey, easily. Hey, hey, you've, been, you've been too humble. Your economy <laughs> rate in every format from T20 and T20, you've bowled the new ball, you've bowled the end overs. Uh, you know, you know, your best, best balls go for six. <laughs> your best balls, your best balls go for six. They either, yeah, yeah, the yeah, six yeah. are out. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, uh, to your point, I could, I could always, yeah, always tell. And you know whether it's good. Well, it didn't it didn't always um, establish the result at the other end. I mean, batsmen still can play a good shot, or they can play a really bad shot to a bad ball. Um, but you knew, I knew within myself that 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 felt right. That's going to be good. That's going to be in the right area. Um, I've got a chance here, and that that was a good feeling. Like when you actually when that ball came out of your hand, just as you always wanted it to. That's I think that's that's a, a really pure feeling for a spin ball. Yeah, hundred percent. And also, just before that release, Dan, every spinner wants that slight pause. Was that part of your bowling action as well? That slight pause, just before you release the ball. Yeah, because you that that strength of the position just sort of allows. You know, I talk about getting over it and following through. If you if you just breeze through your your action, then there's there's no there's nothing to bowl against. There's no force to hold it there. So I, yeah, it was that slight pause, and also. That slight pause leading leads to looking at the batsman a little bit longer, um, getting another, you know, split second read on, on what he's trying to do, and, and and that just gives you a little bit more information in, in the ball that you bowl. So how do you coach that? Say somebody doesn't have it. Say there are lots of guys who run through, breeze through, and you want them to get that slight pause. How do you teach them to integrate it into their into their action? Well, Chahal's an interesting one because he sort of he just sort of sprints through. Sometimes, but I, th I find when his run ups at his slowest is is when he's at his best. So whenever he, well, he, he never never really struggled, but whenever he was working on stuff, we always talked about slowing his run up down. Um, Who's so it? That, Sorry, that, I, 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 I didn't get Chahal, that. Name. Sorry, Sorry Chahal. Chahal, Chahal, yeah. yeah. Chahal. Sorry, um, and so whenever he was not struggling, but just tr working on some stuff, we talked a lot about slowing his his run up down, and I think that's what. Allowed him to to have that that slight pause to build his action, have something to bowl against, because um, sometimes he just sprint through the crease and bowl the ball. And because he's got such a good intuition and understanding of what the batsman's trying to do, he, he that bailed him out a lot. But when he combined the two of having that really strong position, his delivery stride a little bit shorter than normal because he he bowled a few no balls as well. Um, that's when you could see how much how many revolutions he had on the ball. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, you, you see lots of people like Piyush Chavla is another classic example, isn't it? He just runs through the ball and um, sometimes it, you want these guys to, to possibly take a slight pause. And for me, I always felt that if you could get them to have that leap, does it help them to rock back and have that pause? That's always been my thought process. People who run through, do you get them by getting them to have a slight leap? Could you do that? To integrate that into their, yeah, think, into their bull. I think so. I think. I mean, it's yeah. This you you've got to know that individual to see what's going to work for them. But for, for me, the starting point was always just slowing things down a little bit because that 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 speed through the crease is not, or the speed the whole way through is it doesn't allow for that that uh, that ability to bowl against your your shoulder or stay strong in that area. And I, that's I mean those are. The, there's the old, I can think of old spin bowling coaches, Ashley Mell and John Bracewell talking about, you know, being really strong with that front arm and how that works mm. for them. And if if you're just blowing through the crease, then you never give that front arm a chance to actually um, to do its job. Dan, uh, growing up in New Zealand, bowling on those wickets, which are seamer friendly and literally carom board sized or pocket sized grounds. Do you think that steeled you up for tours abroad, and did you actually look forward to coming to the subcontinent? Uh, because possibly, like you mentioned, a couple of overs before lunch, a couple of overs before tea, you hardly get the number of overs, the volume of overs to develop as a spinner. Did you actually look forward to coming to the subcontinent 
the volume of overs and also the, the challenges the challenges that you presented? Uh, not really. It was a bit hard bowling to you guys. <laughs> I think uh, I, I, try, I look back, I think New Zealand, like, when I first started, Eden Park used to spin. And even though it's tiny, it was, it, was a lot of, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun bowling there because it did spin. And then New Zealand moved into the drop-in wickets. 